what will be a, a very interesting, rewarding day. We're going to move now to our plenary speaker. I'd like to uh, invite Kim Bender up, a colleague of mine at the, from the Graduate School of Social Work. Kim's a professor and associate dean for doctoral education in our school. She's also on the steering committee of the Coalition for the Promotion of Behavioral Health, and she's going to introduce uh, David Hawkins. Kim? Good morning. Oh, well, thank you, David. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I've been fortunate to partner with and learn from our plenary speaker through our work on the Grand Challenge, ensuring healthy development for all youth. And I have a detailed bio to share with you, despite his resistance to me sharing. I feel like this is important information and background for us before he comes up to talk. Dr. J. David Hawkins is Professor Emeritus and Founding Director of the Social Development Research Group at the School of Social Work at the University of Washington. He received his BA in 1967 from Stanford University and his PhD in Sociology from Northwestern University in 1975. His research focuses on understanding and preventing child and adolescent health and behavior problems. He seeks to identify risk and protective factors for health and behavior problems across multiple, multiple domains and to understand how these factors interact in the development of healthy behavior and the prevention of problem behaviors. He develops and tests preventative strategies which seek to reduce risk through the enhancement of strengths and reduction of risks in families, schools, and communities. Dr. Hawkins is principal investigator of two landmark studies that I want to point out to you. First is the Community Youth Development Study, which was a randomized field experiment involving 24 communities across seven states, testing the effectiveness of the communities that care prevention system. And the second is the C Seattle Social Development Project, a longitudinal study of 808 multi-ethnic urban youth begun in 1981 when the children were entering first grade. And this project has been continuously funded through the most recent data collection in 2015 when participants were now age 39, which is no small feat when we know longitudinal work is very difficult. The SSDB package of teacher and parent focused preventative interventions called Raising Healthy Children has resulted in significantly lower rates of justice system involvement, teen pregnancies, sexually transmitted infections, and diagnosable mental health disorders compared to controls, as well as significant reductions in racial disparities and economic outcomes and sexually transmitted infections between African Americans and whites through age 30. Dr. Hawkins has author, also authored over 250 peer-reviewed articles and several books, as well as prevention programs for parents and families, including Guiding Good Choices, Parents Who Care, and Supporting School Success. His prevention work is guided by the social development model, his theory of human behavior. All of this work acknowledges his commitment to translating research into effective practice and policy to improve adolescent health and development. And before I invite Dr. Hawkins up to the stage, I also want to introduce our esteemed respondents who will join us after his talk. Beverly Kingston, Dr. Beverly Kingston, for the director for the Center for the Study and Prevention of Violence at the University of Colorado at Denver. Dr. Nathaniel Riggs, associate professor and director of graduate programs at Human Development and Family Studies at CSU. And Dr. Suzanne Kearns, the director of our Center for Effective Interventions here at the Graduate School of Social Work at DU. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hawkins. When I hear that introduction, I just know that those of you who know me know that my father-in-law was an Irish immigrant to this country and he would introduce me differently. <laughs> what he would say to you is this, he'd say, I'd like you to meet my son-in-law Dave, he's a doctor, but it's not the kind does you any good. <laughs> And my wife, Maureen, when she hears those kinds of introductions, she says, yeah, Dave, you're a rumor in your own time, a legend in your own room. <laughs> so uh, the one thing I do need to know is how to get my presentation up. So thank you so much. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Amanda. So I wanted to start by just, uh, well, I would be able to get up to the... When you're my age, you either need glasses to see this or no glasses to see you, and I'd rather see you than this, but there you go. Now, now I think I can deal with it. So uh, as, as we heard from both Jeff and uh, Dean McBride, this 
presentation today is part of a larger set of presentations that are going on at this university. And we're just the first in a series of people who are trying to work together to solve the grand cha challenges that are facing us as a society. And we're gonna talk about the first grand challenge, which is ensure the healthy development of all youth. What gets in the way of that? Well, there are a number of things that get in the way that are challenges to healthy development, and you see them up on the, uh, up on the screen, and those are behavioral problems of young people. So let me just tell you my story. Uh, I didn't start off as a university professor. I was a probation officer working with delinquent kids in my youth, and, uh, and uh, uh, it, the kids that I worked with, the young people I worked with, had found the reinforcing properties of drugs, and they enjoyed getting high and getting loaded or getting drunk. And they enjoyed breaking into houses to get more alcohol if necessary or drugs if they could find them. And my job was to help them get back in school and be successful getting an education so they could have a more productive life. My job, my, the families with my kids were not always places of warmth and affection of love and bonding. They were often places of conflict. And my job was to help those young people be able to live in their homes so they didn't have to get put in an institution or a group home or another setting. And at some point, I began to ask myself a question, which is, isn't there something we should have done before these kids get to this place to promote the positive experiences in schools? They would like it to help families be places of warmth and affection, as we hope that they would be for all young people. And I became a recovering probation officer. <laughs> I left the field with the greatest respect for people who do that work, but I was really interested in prevention. And when I got to the University of Washington, we asked, what's happened in prevention up until that time? It's a long time ago, I'm an old guy now, but it was 1980 and a colleague of ours at the University of Washington did a review of all the delinquency prevention experiments that had been done in America up until that time. There had been nine of them. You might guess, how many do you think were effective in preventing delinquency by 1980? None. We didn't know how to prevent delinquency 37 years ago. Anybody who was standing up there saying, here's the answer to delinquency prevention, it was a bunch of good ideas perhaps, but no evidence of effectiveness. When you looked at both the delinquency and drug abuse strategies in the 1980s, as the Lieutenant Governor said in the 1970s, Mrs. Reagan was saying, just say no. A lot of people were saying, scared straight, we'll send them up to Rahway Prison in New Jersey and let the lifers yell at them. That'll scare the out of them, and they won't, and they won't do that stuff anymore. Uh, and the people who are interested in drugs said, let's get pictures of drugs and baggies of marijuana and show them to kids and pass them around and make sure that kids know the dangers of these things. And, you know, they hoped that the baggie got back to the front of the room at the end of the session. <laughs> so when people study those in controlled trials, what did they learn? Well, first of all, information did provide a, re a preventive strategy against substance abuse. In fact, the kids who were exposed to those information strategies in schools were more likely to use in the next year than kids who we just left alone. Uh, uh, what about scared straight? Scared straight actually increases delinquency. The kids who go get yelled at by the lifers are more likely in the next year to be involved in delinquent acts and arrested than kids who weren't involved in that. It tells us that untested good ideas can be dangerous. The doctors who do you good have an adage. They say, above all, do no harm. And that's what we have to be doing, especially if we're talking about prevention, preventing problems before they exist. Above all, we need to do no harm. So Rick Catalano, who is here in the audience today, but who's my partner in research at the University of Washington, I began to ask this question, so who's been successful in prevention? And when we looked at the field of cardiovascular disease, there was a simple adage that people used, which is to think in public health, if you want to prevent a problem before it happens, you need to address its predictors. You need to understand what predicts those problems. So if we were talking about heart and lung disease today, instead of youth risk behaviors or behavioral health problems, and I were to ask you, what are the risk factors for heart and lung disease, what would you say? Just yell them out. Smoking's one. Poor diet, diet high in fat, what else? Lack sedentary lifestyle and family history. There's some biology in this as well. But we know that lifestyle choices make a difference. From the Framingham study, a longitudinal study, 
following people forward over time to see which factors predicted later problem behaviors. Well, there are other researchers in the world who've been doing this with regard to delinquency and substance abuse and all those behavioral health problems. And another one of them, the leaders in that, Del Elliott, is right here in this room. And he was the leader and has been the leader of the National Youth Study, which looked at the degree to which risk factors earlier in development were predictive of behavioral health outcomes like delinquent behavior. So that by the time that Rick and I were beginning to work in the, our prevention uh, work, we had a lot of research that said what the risk and protective factors were. Uh, and we thought, well, if it works in cardiovascular disease, because we've had a sea change in lifestyle in America, ain't nobody smoking in this room today. There are no ashtrays on the, on the, on the chairs. That would have been different 30, 40 years ago. There would have been ashtrays here. Everybody needs to have their ashtray. Uh, we've had a change in norms because we understood risk and protective factors. And in America today, if you don't exercise, at least you feel guilty. We know we're supposed to do it. And so what we thought is, let's try to understand what people have learned about risk factors for problem behaviors. And the chart that you're looking at here, and I'm just going to sh show you that a couple of things. First, we aren't going to have time to review all these, but the first thing I want you to notice is that there are risk factors in every social environment in which young people grow up, in neighborhoods, in families, in schools, within individuals and peer groups themselves, there can be risk. The other thing I want you to notice that across the columns, there are a number of different behavioral health problems that are listed there. And one of the things that we've learned over time is the same risk factors often predict multiple behavioral health problems. Uh, and so, again, as I say, I'm not going to take time to uh, review these uh, in any detail, but, or else I won't be able, my, our commentators won't have time to talk. So uh, there are also risk factors in the family. And just by, what do we mean by family management problems? When adult caretakers, whatever the structure of the family, whoever is taking kid, take care of kids, when they fail to set clear expectations for what's OK and not OK in this family, when they fail to monitor their children in developmentally appropriate ways, that means when our daughter Nora was two and it was too quiet in the house, Maureen says, Where more, where's Nora, where's she up to? But when our kids were 15 and 17, the problem was never that it was too quiet when they were in the house. The question was, where are they and who are they with when they're not at home? That's monitoring a teenager. And the third risk factor here is excessively severe and inconsistent discipline. This is the connection between child abuse and neglect and later delinquency, between what people call adverse child ex experiences, childhood experiences, ACEs, and behavioral health problems. If we could just help all the parents in Colorado, the adult caretakers in Colorado, set clear expectations, monitor their children developmentally in appropriate ways, and be consistent and moderate in their discipline, we would reduce risk for every one of these health and behavior problems, including internalizing problems of depression and anxiety. There are also risk factors in school. You see lack of commitment to school. There's a story of a guy who gets up in the morning and says, Mom, I'm not going to school. And he says, Oh, I've got to go to school. You got to. He says, I don't want to go to school today. The teachers are always yelling at me. Kids are calling me names. I don't want to go. And she says, Son, you get up and go to school. You're the principal. <laughs> <laughs> we, all, we all have days like that, you know, when we just kind of rather put our heads under the cover. But I'm talking about the young people who've lost their commitment to education, sometimes in the elementary grades because they just couldn't get it and it didn't work for them, they didn't understand it, or sometimes in the middle school years because of the social interactions that happened to them. When you lose your commitment to that role we expect of young people in this society, you're at risk for a number of these behavioral health problems. There are also risk factors within the peer group and within individual, the individuals themselves. That very last one, constitutional factors, has nothing to do about politics. I'm just trying to say there are characteristics of individuals that are biological and neurological that make us differentially susceptible to things like alcohol or other drugs. Some people come to kids the first time they use it, say, Ma, take it or leave it. Other kids say, oh, I like that. I want to do that again. So there are variables that are biological as well. <clears throat> the thing that we thought was that it's not enough just to tell people and reduce the risk factors in the environment. Unless we're promoting positive social development, there's, uh, the, the, the saying is, uh, problem-free does not mean you're successful and healthy. And so we really began to ask ourselves, what about protective factors? Are there factors that when present in the social environment are inhibiting the development of problem behaviors because they're buffering or uh, mediating against uh, uh, the effects of uh, 
the risk exposure. And there's some risk factors that are individual characteristics, and there's some risk factors that are characteristics of the social environment, the family, the school, the community or neighborhood in which people are growing up. We, in our work, said, let's try to organize what we know about protective factors into a strategy for youth development that we could encourage people to use in their everyday interactions with young people. If you take nothing else away from my presentation, I hope you find this useful. If you have five fingers on either of your hands, you should be able to remember this. Uh, our goal is healthy behaviors, and we know, as we said earlier, that individuals are different. In their, our kids, my kids, Quinn and Nora, are peas from the same pod, as far as I know. But uh, they, you know, Nora is a shy person, and Quinn is not, and so that's just personality differences. And so when you do some of the things I'm going to talk about, you do it differently for Quinn than you do it for Nora. Uh, there are three things that we think are important that promote social development. The first is opportunities for active involvement that are developmentally appropriate. When a mom picks up an infant, that's an opportunity for active involvement instead of leaving that infant in the day seat. In the seat. When you're five years old or six years old and they have gerbils in the classroom and you get to feed them, that's an opportunity for active involvement. When you're a teenager and they're gonna be putting new equipment on the playground and they say, okay, we want you all to tell us what you think we should have on the playground, that's an opportunity for active involvement. So making sense developmentally different at different stages. The second thing young people need are the skills to be successful in those opportunities. If they say to the middle schoolers, we want your input on what to put on the playground, but the kids don't know about taking turns when you talk or not to interrupt other people when they're talking, then the encounter, the exchange may not be very successful. If the first grader knows how to feed the gerbils but nobody taught them to water the gerbils, that could be a less successful experience. So, that's the first, opportunity skills. We know there are a range of skills that young people need developmentally. Some of them are social and emotional skills, some of them are cognitive, affective, uh, and behavioral skills, skills for self-management. The third thing that young people need is a consistent system of recognition or reinforcement for skillful performance, for, for effort, for improvement, and for achievement. When those three things are present, opportunity, skills, and recognition, kids start to feel different about the social environments that provide those kinds of things. Whether it's a school classroom, like if the teacher says after I fed the gerbils and water the gerbils too, at the end of the week that it was my week and the kids are running, or the, the kids, the gerbils are running around in their, in their cage and the teacher says, Dave fed the gerbils this week, class, let's all give Dave a hand. Everybody claps for me. I'm saying, hey, I like this teacher, I like this class, I like this place. And that means I'm starting to feel bonded, that I'm part of this school classroom community. I feel good about these people. I like these people. I'm part. I have a connection to these people. Bonding is so important because it provides the motivation to live according to the standards for behavior, which is the fifth element. So opportunity, skills, recognition, build bonding. And bonding is important because it provides the motivation to live according to the standards of that unit. So when my teacher says, after they all clap for me for my, home, for my gerbil feeding, and we have homework this weekend and I want everybody to do their reading homework, I'm likely to do my homework because that's her standard for behavior and I want to please her because I like her. I hope this is making sense to people. It is something that I encourage people to just think about these simple five constructs in your interaction with your own children, if you're a teacher, if you're a youth worker, any, if you employ young people, just think about how do I increase opportunities for active involvement, skills for participation, recognition for effort, improvement, and achievement. That'll build bonding and then be clear and explicit about what are the standards for behavior. As a result of people working in preventive interventions to try to reduce these behavioral health problems, all of these problems have been prevented in controlled studies with good control groups or a randomized or quasi-experimental control groups. Not only that, some of these programs and interventions have actually prevented multiple behavioral health problems. We now know that over 70 prevention programs have been tested and shown to be effective in programs and policies. And one way we know that is from the work of Del Elliott and Sharon Mahalik at the Blueprints for Healthy Youth Development at the University of Colorado. And if you don't know about this, 
website here, blueprintsprogram.com. This is the next really important thing you should take away from this, this presentation. Write it down and go look at the list. Just check on all programs and look at the over 70 programs that are there. They've all been tested in rigorous trials to the point where you can count on they've been effective as promising programs in at least one study in, prevent, in preventing behavioral health problems with no adverse effects. And if they're model programs, they've been effective in two or more studies with at least a year follow-up and shown to be effective. If you're interested in policies, I want to really recommend to you the Surgeon General 2017's report on addiction. If you haven't looked at it, just look at that, that, uh, that important new study. Rick Catalano was on the on the uh, committee that worked on that for the Surgeon General. And finally, we know that effective prevention saves money. The Washington State Institute for Public Policy, the last there, if you're interested in the benefits versus the costs of preventive interventions, there are a whole host of meta-analyses that have been done there that tell you whether this intervention, when done, for families or schools or communities, whether that will produce a more benefits to society than the actual cost of the program or not. Uh, I'm going to just give you a couple of very quick examples, hopefully. Uh, life skills training. I know that a number of people are doing this program, it's Gilbotton's program. It is 15 sessions in the, uh, and, and it relates to what uh, the uh, Lieutenant Governor said about the importance of middle school. This program is done in the middle school years, 15 sessions in the first year, 10 in the second, five in the third year of either 6th, 7th, and 8th, or 7th, 8th, and 9th grade. Uh, and when you look at the results of this, there are just wide-ranging effects on a whole host of behaviors, including violence and delinquency, as well as substance abuse, and also including opioid abuse in later years. Uh, Here's a, uh, and the cost-benefit analysis says that it pr provides $1,600 of benefit for every child who's involved in that program. Benefit cost ratio is $17.25 for every dollar invested. The only place you can get better return on investment is Amazon, as far as I know. With, with another example, strengthening families 10 to 14. This is a program for parents, seven sessions for programs of parents of kids in the middle school years again. This middle school year period, seven weekly two-hour sessions, when you compare the SF 10 to 14, that's the, the group that got the program to the control group, you can just look at the percentage of kids who uh, years later, when they're uh, in adulthood, 21, 25 years old, the, the reduction in drunkenness and illicit drug use in offending, offending behavior cut in half. The really most exciting thing uh, about this particular program, given where we are in the opioid days, is look at the opioid use at ages 21 and, 20 and 25. It says narcotics, age 21 narcotics. That's the proportion of kids in the blue, kids whose families were randomly assigned to get this program, compared to the red, families whose kids were not randomly assigned to get this program. At age 21, less than 1% of the kids whose families were in the strengthening families condition were abusing opioids at age 21, compared to almost 9% of the control group. That's a huge reduction in opioid abuse, and it's taking place over years. At 25, you can see the same thing. The next two, the very last column over here, is age 25 narcotic misuse. We can prevent opioid abuse by doing the right things in middle school using evidence-based interventions. But when we really look at where we're uh, uh, putting most of our resources, we're not really putting our resources where we know we could actually prevent an epidemic instead of respond to an epidemic. Again, a positive cost-benefit ratio of $5 for every dollar invested in this. And when you put those two programs together, NIDA says you will get this life skills training school program with strengthening families 10 to 14. You get a 10% reduction in opioid misuse by the end of high school when you put the two programs together. So there are a lot of... Uh, policies. I've talked about a couple of, of uh, programs. There are also policies that have been shown to be effective. For example, this uh, tobacco clean air restrictions, a smoking ban that's affecting all of us right here, right now, it's one of the biggest reasons that we're having declines in initiation of smoking in this country, because you can't sit in a place like this and say, hey, can I bum a cigarette? 
because you just can't do that anymore. And so it hasn't reduced the people, number of people who are continuous users of tobacco, but it's really reduced tobacco use initiation. So three principles from what we've said so far. First of all, if you want to prevent a problem before it happens, you need to reduce the risk and enhance the protective factors. The second thing is if you want to have success, don't just use good ideas. Use things that have already been proven to work in another place. And if you can define them, things that have been proven to work several times in other places because that's increasing your chances of success. As a, if, you were, if I were your financial advisor, I wouldn't say get all speculative stocks. I'd say start with blue chips. Start with things you know are going to produce a return on your investment. That's the least risky thing to do. Then you can expand, and we need to continue to expand. I'm not trying to make the point that we've now knocked the, you know, we've solved the problem and we don't need more preventive interventions. But if you're trying to do something in your community and you're spending your money or public money or somebody's money to really do something that makes a difference, why not use something that has been shown to make a difference? So all is progress, everybody's happy, good deal, except the problem is we don't invest in prevention any way close to how we prevention, uh, invest in other things. So here's federal drug control spending. This is from the Office of National Drug Control Policy. It, you can see that from 2007 until 2017, over that uh, period of time, or 2008 to 2017, we've moved from $21 billion to $30 billion in trying to respond to the crisis of substance abuse in America, okay? Across that whole time, we spent about half of that money on, and more than half initially, but about 15 million, billion, sorry, billion dollars on law enforcement and interdiction. Right there, all the time. Treatment, finally, in this country, we've, begin, we've begun to increase our spending on treatment. That's the red line. And you can see in the last few years, 14, 15, 16, we're almost spending as much money on treatment as we're on law enforcement. Thanks for that. That's important. And what is that little blue line at the very bottom? <laughs> That's how much we spend on prevention. And what's worst is that most states in this country, the only money the state spends is passed through money from the federal government. So we split that money across all America to do prevention. And you can see that it is not increasing. If anything, it's going down. So we're not putting our investments where we need to be putting them if we wanted to stop the epidemic instead of just respond to the epidemic of opioids. So how do we ensure the healthy development of all youth? Well, Jeff has mentioned the Coalition for the Promotion of Behavioral Health. And we, a group of us got together, and if you have your riddle, little red packet, on the right you'll see uh, a, a, a brief description of our work, but there is a paper that I'll give you the citation for in a minute that says, here's why and how we could unleash the power of prevention. We are ambitious people. We, when I was young, these people told me I was naive and optimistic. I still try to be as naive and optimistic. I'm not as naive, but I'm still optimistic because we think with these advances we've been talking about that we could reduce the prevalence of behavioral health problems in America by 20% and we could reduce the disparities between poor fam kids from poor families and kids from middle class and upper class families or kids from minority or uh, communities of color and kids from uh, European American backgrounds by 20%. That's what we want to do in a decade, in 10 years. How do we do that? We think there are seven action steps that we need to take to do that. The first is that most people in the public don't know about the advances of prevention that I just told you about. Most people don't know there's over 70 programs and many policies that have been tested and shown to be effective. So we need to get that awareness out in the public. We also need to spend more money, as I've suggested, on, on uh, effective prevention policies and programs. The third step, I'm going to actually come back to. I'm going to talk more about this, so I'm just going to skip that one and come back to it. The fourth is, if we're going to do prevention, we better have some criteria for saying what kind of prevention programs we're going to invest in and what are we not going to invest in. So we need to have effective criteria for what's effective, sustainable, equity, enhancing, and cost beneficial. The next thing is we need to really increase the infrastructure to support high quality implementation of preventive interventions. You can buy life skills training, and if you don't know how to use it and you don't bother to use it, it's not going to make any difference. Uh, uh, number six is to make sure that we monitor 
the access of children, youth, and young adults to effective preventive interventions and increase that access. And finally, as Jeff mentioned earlier, and uh, Kim, I think, will be talking about this afternoon, we really, if we're going to really invest in prevention, we're going to have to invest in developing a workforce. In many schools of social work around this country, you can't learn about how to do prevention. You can learn about how to do intervention, but there's not much about prevention. And yet, if we were going to do some of the kinds of things, like our lieutenant governor was, your lieutenant governor was talking about, about putting a behavioral health specialist who would knew, know how to work on preventive things with people who, parents who got referred at Kaiser because they were having behavioral health problems with their kids, that behavioral health specialist better needs to, need to know about prevention, not just how you respond when there's a, a problem. So if you're interested in actually reading the whole paper, either just Google Unleashing the Power of Prevention, and at the National Academy of Medicine, that paper, the whole paper is there, outlines the seven action steps and how to get, move ahead, as well as the progress we've made in prevention science. And also, this has been adopted as part of the social work grand challenges that Jeff talked about uh, earlier. So we say we want to do this in a decade, so what might we get done in a decade? What would be possible in a decade? And I'm going to talk to you about the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and what they've done to unleash the power of Pennsylvania, or <laughs> prevention. <laughs> Trying to get done so these other folks can say something as well. So the first thing is that community is, I mean, prevention is all local. You, you can't do prevention with the exception of some policies at the level of a state or a nation and have effects. Prevention needs to happen where young people are growing up, in the community, in the schools, in the family, in the after school groups, et cetera. Why is that? First of all, because different communities have different norms and values. In some communities, certain behaviors are okay. In other communities, you would never think to do such a thing. Also, there are different youth problem behaviors. In upper income communities, often the problem is heavy, heavy use of alcohol and drunkenness and car accidents. In other communities, that's not the problem. The problem is violence. So different youth problems are prevalent in different neighborhoods or communities, and different neighborhoods and communities experience different levels of risk and protection and have different resources and capacity. We gotta take all those things into account about our own community in order to be effective in prevention. So action step number three says we need to implement capacity building tools that guide communities to assess and prioritize risk and protective factors and select evidence-based prevention programs and policies to address local needs. It's a lot of words, but it just means doing what we were just talking about, which is make sure you know what's going on in the community and what risk factors are most prevalent there and which protective factors need to be enhanced uh, and how you might and the capacity that you have to make uh, changes in those. There are actually two operating systems. If you think about your phone and you think about, I want to use this, I want to use my camera, or no, I just want to call somebody, uh, you, you have to have an operating system to get to the right application. This is the analogy I want you to think about when you think about community-based prevention. Operating systems that help communities get to the right programs and policies for their community. There are two of these that have been developed and tested in well-controlled trials. The first one is called PROSPER. It is uh, developed by a guy named Richard Spoth at Iowa State University. If you're interested in PROSPER, uh, it's at that website. The other is the Communities of Care operating system that uh, Rick Catalano and I and our colleagues at the University of Washington developed, uh, and you can learn more about Communities of Care uh, at that website. So Colorado, uh, I'm sorry, Pennsylvania. I'm talking to you about Pennsylvania. The key elements of Communities of Care are that it's community-owned and operated. It's run by a coalition of, coalition of people in the community uh, from all sectors of the community. All the stakeholders that care about kids need to be on this coalition. It's theory guided. It uses the social development model I talked to you about earlier to encourage everyone who interacts with young people in this community to promote those five protective factors. It's data driven. Surveys of community young people themselves anonymous surveys in which they can say, this is what's happened to me. This is what I've experienced. Do my parents know when I'm, uh, where I am and who I'm with when I'm not at home? I can say no or I can say yes. I can answer these questions privately uh, and anonymously, and that allows us to look at the levels of risk and protection in those communities. 
uh, and we encourage people to use evidence-based, tested and effective policies and programs uh, in responding to the risk factors that they find in their community. And it's outcome focused. You repeat these surveys every two to three years and you can see, did the risk factor we were addressing change over time? Did it decrease? Did the protective factors we wanted to, to increase, increase? And so that, those are the characteristics of communities that care. We did a randomized trial of communities of care, 24 communities across those seven states. Uh, those communities were actually randomly assigned after the mayor, police chief, and school superintendent agreed to random assignment of their community. People say, can't do random assignment in America. You can, we did. And we've been following 4,400 kids forward since they were fifth graders. And what we've learned is that, uh, I'm sorry, what we've learned is that when you look across all the protective factors, you look across all the protective factors at the end of the eighth grade after this has been operating for since fifth grade and, or since sixth grade because we did baseline in fifth grade and then sixth, seventh, and eighth grade interventions. By the end of the eighth grade, if you can do the interocular test, are the blue lines higher than the green lines? Yes. Every one of these protective factors is stronger in CTC communities than in the control communities. Overall, they're more protective environments. And when you look at the outcomes by the end of the eighth grade, a 33% reduction in tobacco use, 32% reduction in alcohol use, you can read the other ones, delinquent behavior, and even binge drinking five or more drinks in a row, significantly reduced by being a CTC community and following the CTC process. We follow these young people up now through age 21 and 23. I'm just showing you the results at the end of grade 12. You can see cigarette alcohol, delinquency, violent behavior, all significantly reduced uh, by the end of the 12th grade, and a benefit cost analysis uh, done by the Washington State Institute for Public Policies for, says for every kid in that community who is in a CTC community, you get $5.13 in benefits in terms of reduced criminal justice and juvenile justice costs, uh, increased employment that those kids have over time, and other uh, benefits from participation in a CTC, uh, living in a CTC community. What about right here in Colorado? Uh, in, in the Montbello neighborhood, the uh, Center for the Study and Prevention of Violence, and I hope I'm saying the names right, uh, are, have been doing a study with funding from the CDC on using the CTC approach in Montbello. And what you're seeing are changes from 2013 to 2016 in the perpetration of violence reported by young people, aggression, victims of violence, and you can see that these are all decreasing in, those, in, those, uh, in that Montbello neighborhood uh, as they participate in communities that care. So back to Pennsylvania. In, in 1994, the governor of Pennsylvania, Tom Ridge, said, I'm going to crack down on crime but I want to get smart about crime too, so I want to invest in prevention. And at that time, the, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania said, let's start doing communities that care in the state. And they have been doing 16 cycles of communities that uh, care training over the subsequent years. There are about 65 communities using communities that care in Pennsylvania who are currently functioning. Uh, and uh, this is really the first time we've had a chance to really study CTC's long-term effects without us being involved in the research, because people always think if you're involved in the research, you might cheat. We didn't, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but this is an independent uh, study, so it's nice to have this opportunity. So in Pennsylvania, there are coalitions all around the state of Pennsylvania. And what we see, and I'm sorry about the colors of this, when they follow a panel of kids forward over time and compare kids in CTC communities that to control communities, not control, but to comparison communities, they weren't randomly assigned, they're just comparing to other communities in Pennsylvania, what you see is delinquency down in that group compared to their comparison kids in other communities by, 10, by over 10%. Interestingly, academic achievement up by 33% as is uh, academic uh, engagement, school engagement, peer influence, negative peer influence also down. So the first thing that Pennsylvania did was invest in implementing communities of care in lots of communities across the state. The next thing that was really important that they did is they said, okay, we believe if you're gonna do something and know whether it produced an outcome, you have to have measurement, you gotta measure it. And so, Every, uh, every other year, Pennsylvania administers something they call the Pennsylvania Youth Survey. We call it the Communities of Care Youth Survey, but different states call it what they want. And uh, that survey's been offered voluntarily to communities in the state, in the Commonwealth, for uh, years. And now over 400 
school districts say, of course I want that, because I want that data for my planning in our community, and especially in CTC communities. And so that data is available, and what you begin to see is that different communities have different levels of risk exposure. Across the bottom are all the major risk factors that we are able to survey, uh, get information on by surveying young people. And you'll see in this particular community or high school, this is 10th graders in a high school, uh, you see poor family management is an elevated risk factor. About 80% of kids are reporting their parents don't really know where they are and who they're with when they're not at home. So people say, I'm going to focus on this risk factor. Over here, favor favorable attitudes towards drug use in this school, which happens to be an alternative school, were also rampant. Even kids who didn't use say, what's the big deal if kids use? It's okay. Um, so that's one community, but go uh, across the state to another community and you get a different profile of risk. So what we're trying to say is address the risk factors that are most prevalent in the community, bring them down, change the social environment. And Pennsylvania did that measurement to allow people to see what to focus on in their community. So the next key that they did was establish criteria for funding preventive interventions that are effective. This is action step number four that we looked at before. And the Commission on Crime and Delinquency in Pennsylvania actually came to here and said, let's look at the blueprints at the University of Colorado. It's the best list. And let's select from the blueprints list those programs that we think we can put in place in Pennsylvania given our resources. And they chose, uh, I think that's 10 or 11 programs, that they said these are on the Pennsylvania list. You can invest in these. And if you show us the need for these, we'll pay for them. Uh, and so they now have a list of evidence-based policies and programs that they will invest in. And they invested state funds in those policies and programs. There is a, uh, a, a delinquency prevention uh, programs fund in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and I owe Brian Bumbarger uh, a, a lot uh, for having this information, so thank you, Brian. Uh, but that money, which has been sometimes as much as maybe $20 million a year and sometimes as little as $2 million a year, but they keep putting money into preventive intervention. That's state money, not just federal pass-through money. As a result, this is these green counties, those are the counties in Pennsylvania that had evidence-based prevention programs that are on the University of Pennsylvania, or the, uh, the state list. And you, there are different programs, life skills training, or little green dots, uh, strengthening families, I think they're little blue dots. Anyway, this is what it looked like in 1999. Here's the penetration of evidence-based programs in Pennsylvania by 2015. And they created an infrastructure along with Penn State University. The head of that infrastructure uh, called the Epicenter is Brian Bumbarger, was Brian Bumbarger, uh, who built this system to provide to communities the coaching and technical assistance they needed to be successful and effective in implementing this T CTC system and these effective preventive interventions. And uh, as a result, What's been happening in Pennsylvania in terms of delinquent behavior? Well, if you look at this chart from 2007 to 2013, what you'll see is there has been a 29% reduction in juvenile arrest rates for violent crimes in Pennsylvania over that period of time. What does that lead to? Well, that leads to having to place fewer delinquents into secure confinement, into delinquency placements. Delinquency placements have actually gone down by 45%. Other things going on in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania as well uh, to try to reduce this. But these decreases mean that Pennsylvania is spending $85 million a year less today on incarcerating juveniles than they were in 2007. That's a lot of money to be able to put either into the general fund or hopefully a proportion for prevention of state money. We've saved all this money in part by doing prevention. Let's put money into prevention. So when we were done with the test of community care, we recognized we need to get it more available to people. And we developed what's called Community Care Plus. It's a web stream training system that's facilitated by the local coordinator or facilitator in the community who runs this program in the community. And the exciting thing for me about being here today is, because, is that Colorado adopted CTC as a statewide prevention system. And I give credit to the governor and lieutenant governor and all the people in the staff and the people in the Colorado Department of Public Health and in 
and environment uh, because, because they said, we're going to invest in prevention if we're going to legalize marijuana. We're going to invest in prevention if we're going to legalize marijuana because we don't want this to result in kids getting off the success track and our economy suffering as a result of it. And so this biennium, if I'm not mistaken, your state is investing over $9 million in prevention in ensuring that communities have the, the skills and tools they need to be effective in using evidence-based prevention using the CTC system. I don't know if you can see this, but the blue counties are counties in Colorado that now have a Communities of Care Coalition. The dark blue counties are counties in Colorado that have two or more action, uh, coalitions. And as we heard earlier, there are 48 CTC, Communities of Care, coalitions operating right now in the state of Colorado. And Colorado has developed, like the epicenter in Pennsylvania, has developed through the uh, Department of uh, Public Health and Environment a coaching system that we help from the Center for Communities of Care make sure that they get the training and CTC they need. And the Center for the Study and Prevention Violence right here at the University of Colorado is helping them with thinking about policies and other implementation uh, 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 assistance for implementing uh, the community of care system and the uh, policies and programs that come out of it. And as a result, there are CTC coaches right here in Colorado that are working to help the 48 Colorado communities that are doing communities of care. So Colorado is, unleashing the, is investing on unleashing the power of prevention. It provides the Healthy Kids Colorado survey that includes measures of some risk and protective factors so that CTC communities can look at their levels of risk and protection as well as behavioral health outcomes. There's a menu, a, a strategies guide, a menu of test and effective pr programs and policies that are available that can be supported here in Colorado through this initiative and it's outcome focused. There is an evaluation that the University of Colorado is conducting to say, is this really working? So I'm just so honored to be here today and so excited to learn from all of you who are working on communities that care and the prevention of behavioral health problems of people in Colorado. Thank you so much for your attention and time. Well, thank you very much, David, for, for that really important talk. It kind of gives us a state of prevention science as well as bringing it home here to Colorado. So thanks very much for, your, for that. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Beverly Kingston and Nate Riggs and Sue Kearns up to offer some uh, words in response. Good morning, everyone. I'm Beverly Kingston. I direct the Center for the Study and Prevention of Violence. Ooh, I see you, Boulder. <laughs> I know you've been sitting a while, and you're just a few more minutes with us. So let's see what happens with this. Okay, I'm very short, <laughs> so I'm trying to. Okay, and uh, you know, thank you so much, David, for your for your presentation, and and I really want to thank the leaders who and giants really who've come before me. To, to set this all up. I started working on communities that care in, I guess it was around 1997, in the Gulfton community in Southwest Houston. And we had, at that time, we had a million dollars from the state to do something to prevent violence and problem behaviors. And we formed a coalition and we got wind of communities that care and we leveraged different resources at the, at the state, the local, and the federal level to put that into place. But we didn't yet have, we, we had only begun to hear about the Blueprints programs and what was happening. So we were putting a lot of things into place. Actually, I was. I had the best of intentions when I grouped a, a set of delinquent peers together and had to then call in the police to shut down the program. <laughs> and. Um, and you know, I did have really good intentions. I thought well, it was well intended, and you know, I, I found out it wasn't working. It wasn't, and 
And, I, and the research question that's been driving me in my career are what are the very best things we can be doing for our kids and communities and families and how do we put those into place? And so that's where I, I, I followed these masterminds around <laughs> the country and moved out to Colorado because of what Dell was doing with the Blueprints programs. And, and here's what I, I want to say today is that Dell and I have had this conversation multiple times that you know, we've, we've said we can reduce violence and problem behaviors by 30%. Um, we're a little bit, well, at least I am, I'm still idealistic. I'm still, I think I'm still kind of young. <laughs> but I have been doing this now for about 22 years. And, but I think 30, I mean, 30% 30 is what is, we see in the randomized trials. So if we were to put into place what was proven to work, we could make these kinds of reductions. And what's, so exciting is that in Colorado, we have this incredible infrastructure that we're building through communities that care. For a while, I was carrying around Brian's infrastructure article, um, dreaming of one day that it, could this happen. And the state um, is funding a prevention infrastructure. And we have the chance right now to implement this really, really well, which I think is very, very exciting. And I also was, was struck by what David talked about in terms of the, the lack of funding. So we do have some funds in Colorado, but we have many gaps. And I think the power of prevention is unfortunately the best kept secret. And we need to do a better job of getting that information out. Because if until we do, it's going to be hard to convince the public that we actually know what works and to fund what works. And the last thing I'll say is that we see this after the mass shootings. And we just had another one where our center, we get calls and we over and over again say the same talking points about that we need to invest into, in prevention, but there seems to be a little bit more readiness to hear, to, an openness to want to hear that we actually do know what works and that there are solutions. So I think the time to get this public conversation out is now and that, that it, it's ripe and ready. So I'll stop here. All right. All right. Yes, thanks, David, for your uh, insightful, entertaining, and engaging uh, talk. Uh, I'm Nate Riggs. I'm at uh, Colorado State right now, but I am a Pennsylvania State University transplant, like a couple of other people in this room. Yeah, I am a little bit taller than. Um, there we go. Okay. How's that? Okay. So. Um, David, I don't know if you remember this, I don't know why you would, but my first job as a graduate research assistant at Penn State um, was to fan out throughout the state of Pennsylvania in 1999 and conduct the CTC statewide, uh, um, Pennsylvania statewide process evaluation um, where we, uh, we really, we, it, this wasn't about outcomes, it was more about how was the process working for CTC key leaders. Do we have any CTC key leaders or CTC folks in the audience? I thought that we did maybe, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so um, we would go out and we would, we would ask these, I don't know if you could call it unleashing the power of prevention, but it was a series of graduate students that were unleashed into the, uh, the, <laughs> the state. Uh, and we would, we would ask about what, you know, what are the, um, the characteristics of the CTC coalitions themselves and the kind of the, um, the context around those coalitions that was favorable towards CTC uh, coalition sustainability. And as you can imagine, there was some variation in, in uh, these characteristics and the sustainability of these, of these coalitions. And so, um, you know, you can imagine some of these, this was before the day and age of internet uh, based survey collection, so we would go out and we we talk face to face with these key leaders, and and uh, you can imagine that a lot of them went really well, and a lot of the key leaders would talk about how they were really uh, quickly able to coalesce their coalitions, and and they had the internal and external resources that they could capitalize on to uh, to pull off the. Uh, risk and protective factor survey and translate those data into evidence-based programs and even evaluate how they were doing, right? Uh, and, and those were fun interviews to have. Uh, they uh, lasted maybe about 30 minutes. And, and at the end, I came away thinking, you know, this is really, uh, this, this CTC process is really working in this community. I can see these coalitions really sustaining over time. Um, in some rare occasions, we would go out and we would talk with key uh, leaders, and those key leaders uh, these interviews would be a little bit less fun because they would talk about how 
uh, you know, maybe there wasn't a, a lot of readiness to uh, take on this process, or maybe some of the factors that were external to even what was going on in the coalition were kind of dragging down what was going on, and some of them really wanted to kind of quit and go back to what they were doing before, right? Um, these interviews, as you can imagine, were not as fun. Um, some of them would take about an hour and a half. I think my record was maybe about a two and a half hour interview, um, which shows you how good of an interviewer I was. Um, but uh, the, you know, and I would come away from those interviews thinking, you know, I don't know if, if the process is working in this community. I don't know if these coalitions are gonna be able to sustain over time. Um, now, if we fast forward, I don't know, what is it, 17 years now? Uh, I think I have a more kind of seasoned view of these coalitions that on, at the time, at that kind of cross-section in history, seem to be struggling. I mean, if there's, there's one thing, among the many things that prevention science has taught us is that how challenging systems change can be and how long that process can take, right? And so um, I think that, uh, that uh, and what those coalitions that appear to be struggling may just be, um, may reflect the natural progress of that system's change as it evolves, right? So uh, I, I think, you know, what we're really asking these communities to do is we're asking communities to harness the power of prevention. And some communities are going to be able to just do that from the get, right? They're going to have that, that infrastructure, that capacity. We're going to be talking about infrastructure uh, later on today, right? Um, other communities are going to have to build that infrastructure, and along the way, there are going to be some maybe some some struggles, some some bumps and bruises, some you know two steps forward, one step back. Uh, and, and I guess I would advocate for right now, if there are coalition members out there that are experiencing that, that that it is likely reflects the natural progression of systems change and how challenging that is. So don't don't give up and engage in that in that struggle. Of course, it's frustrating, but engage in the struggle. Uh, I think there's also a role for uh, applied prevention researchers in this process, too. We can partner with communities, uh, community coalitions, and true community research partnerships to help guide this process in empowering ways so that on the back end, coalitions uh, have the capacity and the infrastructure and the, um, and, and the power. Uh, they, they can harness that power of prevention in, in, true, uh, in, in, in true ways. So um, with that, I'll hand that up. Now we go back down to the short version. Okay. All right, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, I'm Sue Kearns, I'm the Executive Director for the Center for Effective Interventions, and I just want to thank you, um, the panelists that came before me as well, um, for saying so many of the points that I was going to make. <laughs> I have a few new ones, though. Um, but I wanted to also acknowledge the seminal work of Dr. Hawkins. When I was a grad student about 20 years ago, Hawkins and Catalano <laughs> and the work on their prevention, um, the, uh, the risk and protective factors was just such um, an engaging and just riveting thing to start um, thinking about and informing our work and going and um, seeing that uh, that how we understand the etiology of youth problems and malleable risk factors and how prevention efforts could really change those things just really is, was so exciting. Um, at that time, I feel like the field of prevention science was really coming into its own. And the emergence of these evidence-based practices um, and, and um, the movements that were happening in psychology and social work quickly followed as the research was just undisputable that these programs were far surpassed treatment as usual. Um, and so this was really important, and I think also Dr. Hawkins mentioned in his, um, in his remarks as well about the Washington State Institute for Public Policy and a lot of the work that they did, which I think in addition to saying we want to do things that we know are going to work, also gave us a fiscal imperative to do so. And I think that was just really, really important combination of work that's happened that's brought this field um, to the forefront, but unfortunately, I agree with you, is still also the best kept secret around. Um, and I want to go back to the enviable research. Every time I've heard Dr. Hawkins talk, I'm like, I wish I would have done that study, because <laughs> it is just such amazing work, and it has so transformed the field. And I think behind all of that is 
really effective implementation. And that's what I wanted to focus my remarks on as well, because it's not the field of dreams. We build it, they don't necessarily come, <laughs> right? It'd be nice if that were the case. But there's the field of implementation science that's kind of grown up alongside prevention science and intervention research that doesn't just tell us what to do, but helps give us some strategies and evidence-based approaches for how to do it. And I think that those conversations going right alongside what works is really, really critical and important and just as worthy of funding and time and education um, in the field as well. Um, and I'll just give an example of how this plays out in a couple of different ways um, across some of the action goals that Dr. Hawkins mentioned in his talk as well. Um, for example, action goal number two was to increase the percentage of all public funds that are spent on effective intervention uh, and prevention programs. But we know that even programs that have been found to be effective in these randomized controlled trials, when they are translated and transported out into communities, sometimes the impact of those is no different than treatment as usual. That our implementation efforts get in the way of really being able to get those high um, big bang numbers you know, that we're able to get in those trials. And so focusing on, so for example, um, my, the Center for Effective Interventions, we work on one of the programs Dr. Hawkins mentioned and trying to get multi-systemic therapy out into the field. One of, uh, Sandra Schoenwald did some really seminal work looking at transportability of this intervention. She found that there's almost a direct linear relationship between how um, people are keeping to the model, right, how much fidelity they have to the model, and clinical outcomes for kids, and that there's actually a threshold that you have to do a certain amount of um, adherence to the model to be able to get those outcomes. And that really in the field, there's a lot of variability in the ability for people to have those skills to be able to deliver the intervention with that and get those types of outcomes. And so that's where implementation science really helps us see what can be effective. Um, and just one more brief example. I know we're running short on time. <laughs> um, but action goal number seven was to create a workforce development strategies to prepare practitioners in the health and human service professions for roles in promotion and prevention interventions. I wanted to mention some work that Melanie Barwick did back in 2011. She surveyed nearly 600 community mental health directors and administrators and asked them, your new hires, what kind of skills do they have to enter into a workforce to be able to deliver these types of prevention and intervention programs? And what she found was disheartening. Most of the people that responded to this survey said, yeah, the people that we're getting that are coming into the workforce are not well prepared to use critical appraisal skills, to survey the literature and find out what best practices are, or to have the core underlying skills to be able to deliver these interventions. We're having to do that as on-the-job training. And when you have over 30% of your workforce tr turning over each year, that is a huge ask for our communities. And so I, I think there's an imperative also in our institutions of higher education and as these coalitions come together and have more power and influence to really support our institutes of higher education to make sure that we're producing graduates that are really prepared to enter into the workforce and deliver these types of interventions as well. And I also will put in a plug for advocacy for providing a livable wage for our workers too so they stick around. <laughs> um, but underlying the promising findings from Pennsylvania, and hopefully those to come from Colorado, I believe is high quality intervention. And I want to thank you all for the opportunity to comment on Dr. Hawkins' amazing work. Thank you. Jeff, Jeff could I say one thing? Yeah. It's hard to get good help, and I'm kind of an example of that. Uh, I didn't say much about what communities that help really is or how it works. There, in, on the left side of your folder, underneath the agenda, if you don't know about communities that care, and you said, boy, that was pretty quick, I didn't get much about what that was, uh, there's a, a description of communities that care and also of the whole uh, training system. So if people are interested in learning more about communities that care, it's there. Uh, I just forgot to mention it. Okay, good, thanks. Well, thanks to each of the panelists for very good comments. and. Uh, we're running a little behind, but I'd like to offer uh, the, a chance for questions uh, from the audience. Anybody have questions for relative to David's talk? Yes. Would you like to come up to the mic? Yeah, I'll be back. Usually I'm Well, it's, yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> It'll help the live streamers that are watching. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. And your name is, can you tell us who you are? Tracy Jewett. And um, I'm a member of a community that is currently implementing the initiative of Communities That Care. And I guess one of the questions that I have, and two, as it pertains to my community, is the personalization of the CTC model. And in particular, how then with evidence that has been gathered in many places that is often referred to, then that perhaps doesn't necessarily apply to where we're at or has a whole different component. So I'm curious about where then trauma plays into this, especially as we've evolved over the last 20 years and understand the rates of sexual assault on children and what's reported, and certainly then what those outcomes are and those responses to that trauma, which apparently is so much of this. So I'm curious about updating those risk factors about trauma and the protective factors of, you know, um, trying to mitigate that and having that conversation and making that a piece of it as well. Uh, great question. Uh, the, the first thing is that we are continually trying to up, upgrade and update what our knowledge is of risk and protective factors. So we often in presentations, like saying, if you know of stuff that we should be including, uh, please let us know about it, because we only get better by all sharing information and learning about it. The second thing I would say is that we really think that we, what we're trying to do is reduce trauma, prevent trauma in the first place. So if we can pre prevent kids from having adverse childhood experiences, we think that that, through helping their parents or adult caretakers do a better job of helping them get off to a good start, by helping, just tiny examples. Uh, when a mom carries a baby in a snuggly, uh, Tiffany Fields has shown that just that, having that baby in a snuggly actually increases secure attachment. Uh, so that's a simple thing that people can do. And the point is that we know there's trauma. We know that there are adverse childhood experiences that people encounter. And part of what we're trying to do is do everything we can think of to find and identify preventive interventions that help reduce the likelihood of that trauma in the first place, and then to reduce the likelihood that that trauma has consequences for children by preparing both the families and the children for, and the teachers who are dealing with kids who've come from traumatic experiences or adverse childhood experiences, to be able to provide opportunity skills and recognition that are appropriate to that child in that social setting. So. Uh, we, I didn't emphasize trauma as much in my, in my thing, uh, in my presentation, but we recognize that adverse childhood experiences can increase trauma, can increase stress, and that those are things that are hard for young people, and therefore we need to be dealing with them. So, uh, uh, I don't know. You don't think it's presumptive then, at a minimum, that perhaps within those communities that we do maybe overlay what that's about in taking trauma into account when we're looking and examining these risk factors and what strategies we would use. I mean, because again, I, I was reading through the program and I guess that was the one thing that really stands out to me. And again, particularly where I live. I live in the Springs. We are surrounded by Army bases. We are surrounded by soldiers. We are surrounded. And I see that as a major piece that's missing in addressing and to where that comes into play, whether folks will engage, if they recognize themselves in what it is that CTC or two in the prevention strategies, um, you know, really speaks to them. And, and, and again, highlighting to the sexual um, abuse that we understand now and the rates and how prevalent it is. So, you know, I guess too, that's just, I'm wondering as the models are so fixed that are we not able to lay some presumptive assumption of trauma with all of that in terms of, yeah. You know, and how we. Boy, I hope the models aren't fixed. Yeah. Because the models are the very first point that I tried to make is that different communities have different levels of exposure to trauma, adverse child experiences, stress, sexual abuse. A lot of those things vary within different communities. And so every community's got to look at saying, what are the issues that are really relevant to our community and how do we address them? And CTC provides a foundation for doing that. But CTC doesn't, doesn't specify, oh, in this community, this is what's going to happen. In this community, this is what happened. What, what it says is get all the stakeholders together in that community who understand what the research says as well as what the experiences of real people are in every life to think about how can we find the best solution to our problem. And 
the more, the more data we have for measurement, the more data we have for making plans on what risk factors we should address, the better we are off we are. So the survey gets what you can get from kids in school surveys, but there are data from public health departments, from schools, from, uh, from health services, from Kaiser, you know, from all the providers that often can provide us more information from uh, the criminal justice and juvenile justice system, law enforcement as well, that are data that can help us refine our intervention based on what we know about our community and what people are being exposed to. So I, I would really encourage in a, in a community where you say, there's some other issues that we better make sure are on the table here. I would encourage people in communities to bring those to the table and say, here's what the issues are, and here's what we know about their effects on young people and families and schools, et cetera, and, and, and here's some thoughts about how we can address them. Uh, obviously, you wanna go first to say, are there people who've been successful in addressing them? And uh, can we use what they've found in other places as a foundation for what we do? But in the end, we've gotta do what's gonna work in this community for us. Indeed. I appreciate you, thank you. Thanks for your question, very good. Lena, do you want to come up so we can uh, get you on the streaming as well? Thanks. Uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. My, my name is Lena Lundgren. I'm a professor here at Denver University School of Social Work. Um, so I had two questions. Um, I'm in the treatment field. Um, so my first question is, um, have you had the opportunity to do research, because you have such wonderful community level data, to look at whether or not um, there have been, there's a reduction in opioid use in the communities that have these models compared to others? That's my first question. Because we know that so much of the opioid epidemic is about access today. It's really, you know, it's going through the whole country and the, com the communities that are most affected are those which actually have an easy access route to opioids. So that's my first question. So have you been able to look at whether or not these models have been successful at um, reducing opioid use among young people? And the second one is on my own plea, which is I really believe that primary prevention and treatment has to go together and that we really have to respond together to core occurring issues, specifically trauma, uh, mental health, and substance use. Um, so I want to talk a little, uh, ask you then the question, how are you envisioning, have you tried research projects, developed, tested models where you actually in, um, integrate prevention and treatment for young adults? Let me start with the second question first. Uh, the integration of treatment and treatment professionals into the preventive system that's being developed is essential. We were saying all the stakeholders and people in the treatment community are part of the stakeholder groups that are concerned about these issues. And I think one of the things that's been important over the years is for all of us to listen and hear what other people are learning. Because uh, there was a time in America where people who were in the treatment world, especially people who were in the alcoholism treatment world said, you can't prevent alcoholism. It can't be prevented. It's inevitable. You can treat it, you can intervene, but you can't prevent it. We know better than that now. We didn't have evidence of that uh, 30, 40 years ago, and now we do. And so it means that both, of, both prevention and treatment has to be open exactly. to okay. each other. And, to, and, and so when we talk about prevention, we're just talking about the relative balance of how much we spend on treatment versus prevention. And if you look at the opioid crisis, uh, so often people say, well, when, when we really uh, needed uh, help, there was not enough there. And, and yet, when they're talking about needing help was when the person was addicted and they needed treatment. And all we wanna continue to argue for is that's not the place to start. We know the earlier kids start to use drugs or alcohol, the greater is the risk that they will abuse them later. So even just preventing initiation at young ages, uh, delaying initiation of, of, of drug use is an effective preventive strategy. So we want all of us to say it's possible now to prevent and to treat, and that means we gotta work together. On the question about we have not seen yet effects on opioid misuse from the Communities That Care trial. 
uh, but we are following those young people up at older ages uh, so that we uh, will, uh, and we hope that a new study will follow them up at age 25, but we have data through age 21 and 23, and we haven't seen effects yet at the population level on opioid uh, misuse uh, in the analyses we've done. It has been more on uh, alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, uh, marijuana use, uh, uh, violence, and delinquent behavior that we've seen those significant effects. Thank you. I would just have to say as, as a Swedish citizen, where we always think of prevention and treatment going together, not fighting each other, mm -hmm. I'm very glad to hear that. And if you ever want to do a study about long, longitudinal study of opioid use, call me. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that the city of Malmo, Sweden, yeah. is implementing citywide communities of care right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sweden. Go. Well, I think we better uh, take a break. I'd like to thank David, Sue, Nate, and Beverly for their, for their insightful comments this morning. And we'll be back in 15 minutes.